Hey everybody, Bo Bryant, the Restaurant Giant, back with a much anticipated and long awaited piece of information for you. But it couldn't be more timely today. We're going to talk about combating inflation. And I'm going to give you the top five game changers that will help the most prolific restaurants out there rise above this dynamic and challenging time that we live in right now. I'm going to share secrets with you from the biggest and best restaurant chains out there and why you're feeling it and they're not and how they deal with it. So buckle up. Let's get rolling. This kind of goes without saying the inflationary pressure is hitting all three of the sweet spots, closing in and suffocating out our ability to maximize our profit between the cost of goods, our operational expenses, and labor. It is hitting us from every single angle. So we are going to unpack this and solve it. And I'm going to start by talking about one of the biggest fears in the industry. This is definitely the operator's dilemma. And the myth is to follow. So when inflation happens, it doesn't matter at what intersection it comes from, whether it's food, operational costs, your rent is going up, you can't find labor operators fear raising their prices. And that turns into this inability to not pass along the cost and lose money, or they will do nothing. And eventually you're gonna lose both money and customers or potentially even your business. So let's dive into the best in class strategy. I'm gonna start with the four P's and this whole piece is centric to being able to adjust your menu and your pricing. And around that, we have to focus on these four critical elements. The first is promotion. You will always have items that aren't impacted or that are more profitable or contribute a better percentage or profit dollars to the bottom line. We wanna promote those items. Next, preparation. The methods in which we prepare our product have long gone on without study in many restaurants. And today we're gonna to talk about how to attack the preparation method and create some savings in labor and even some product rationalization, which leads us perfectly into product and justifying and understanding our product and what things we can change about our product. And then finally, but most importantly, you've heard me talk about it time and time again, your point of distinction, what sets you apart, what makes you better, special, different, what makes that dish unique, what makes your environment, your experience, your staff, your service better than the others that you're competing against. All right, so let's dive into preparation. We have to identify what's not working. Where is the most impactful item that this inflation is hurting us and or what is the least profitable item on the menu and what can we do to tweak our preparation? So after we analyze the item, then we analyze the portion. And there's a couple of things that we can do. We can do a portion reduction or an increase where we can reduce the portion, but not the price. That's a risky one. We can increase the portion and increase the price even more. Let me give you an example. Years ago, there was a steakhouse and for legal reasons, I probably won't mention who it was, but they had this eight ounce filet and let's say they called it the Victoria cut filet. And as the price continued to go up on beef tenderloin, they decided that they were going to change that item, but not just reduce it to seven ounces, they changed the name. So the name went from the Victoria cut filet to the princess cut filet. And then they offered it in a seven ounce portion, which was same price as the eight, but then they offered it also in a nine ounce portion. And that was more money. So that was a really, really smart strategy to reduce the item, but not the cost, and to add another option where it took the focus off of the whole change strategy. It looked like they made the change because customers were asking for different sizes. Very, very brilliant strategy. Next, there's portion redistribution. And as a ratio, we can do less of one and more of the other. I'm gonna give you two fluid examples that we've done specifically in our restaurants. Number one is on our bistro menu, under our entrees, we had a burger in our entree category, and the burger was this gourmet burger. It was an eight ounce patty of prime rib and chuck and brisket all blended together. It was a fantastic cut. It was really expensive. The price was hurting us, but the item was really popular. So instead of taking any kind of position on that item, we ended up adding an item to our appetizer category by doing three sliders, but they were three two ounce sliders. The cost that we saved on that two ounces of meat far offset the cost of three slider buns versus a regular bun. It was more profitable, took some of the pressure off the burger in that category, and it allowed for us to charge the same price for the sliders as we charge for the burgers, making it more of an appetizer, more of a shareable, 
that was a really, really solid strategy for us and it worked well. I'm gonna give you another one that is a little bit more straightforward. At our Concept Hellaburger, we had a Cuban sandwich and we had to do a handful of things in this particular case. Number one was the pork was really, really expensive and it was laborsome and time consuming. We had four ounces of pork and two ounces of shaved ham. So what we did was we changed it to three ounces of pork and we added an extra ounce of the shaved ham. So three and three. The volume on the sandwich stood up much higher. It looked like it was more value. It made the sandwich look bigger. That was a fantastic unintended consequence. We kept the price the same. We reduced the food cost by about 4% on the item and we changed the name just so people wouldn't feel like we were just trying to upset the equilibrium and make more money off of it. So we shifted it from a Cuban to a Barbecuban and that little namesake got more attention. It was a little bit more unique. Next is presentation. So you can replate or represent the items to make adjustments and I'm gonna give you an example. We were serving about 10 ounces of French fries on our sandwich plates and we decided to cut that back to eight. So instead of having a closed faced sandwich on the menu, we did an open face to take up more volume on the plate and then that reduction of 10 ounces to 8 ounces of fries the plate still looked full or fuller than it did before and that gave us that opportunity through preparation to change an item to reduce some product but not necessarily reduce the price all right let's dive into product same thing we're going to identify what's not working what has the most impact negatively or what's the least profitable then we're going to analyze our product via looking at some similar alternatives so for example could I switch my baby back ribs to a St. Louis rib or even a meaty back rib or a beef back rib then could I change my chicken wings to a boneless chicken wing or could I take some pressure off the chicken wing category by adding boneless wings as an example don't try to make huge cuts or changes that are going to affect the quality but certainly look at what your options are maybe you could move from a fresh item to a frozen item when you're talking about certainly things like baby back ribs and chicken wings I don't think it's going to impact the quality as much as you think. It's at least worth trying, tasting side by side to identify that. Next, further processed items. So the reduction of labor, that is certainly being felt by these inflationary pressures. So further processed. If you've watched our video before on the knife versus the whisk, you know exactly where I'm going. The guest cannot taste what your blade goes into versus what a machine's blade went into. If it's your plot items like produce, lettuce, onion, tomato, what's the difference if a machine cuts it or if you do? Well, I guarantee you that machine cost has stayed fixed. Your labor cost has not. So taking the knife out of the hand, putting the whisk back in their hand, reduce some labor, buy your items that are going to meet your quality standards that are already processed. Next, what about the reduction of processed items? If it's something like the whisk, for example, if you're buying your dressings and you could make your dressings, dressings are relatively fast. They don't take a whole lot of time to make. If you can reduce that expense on those items by putting the whisk back in the hand by using core ingredients that you already have, you can reduce the cost of product. Next, expansion of a category. So you want to chase those categories or expand those product categories that are very profitable. Let's say my burgers are not profitable, but my sandwiches are. I can do a lot with sandwiches. So cut a couple of burgers, put some emphasis and some new items and some new ideation into your sandwiches and watch how that runs. Next, the reduction of the category in an item just like burgers, we talked about that. We ran from that or contracted it by getting rid of a couple of items and adding them somewhere else. All right, let's talk about product evaluation. In this prep list of mine, you can see I've got a couple of items highlighted. I wanna check out what is my shelf life. This is the most important thing in a production schedule. If you don't know this, take the time to figure this out. What is the shelf life of every single item that you make? When you understand what the shelf life is, you can change the behavior. I'm gonna give you a great example. We worked with the concept and they were making salsa fresh every single day. The challenge is that salsa doesn't even taste good on the first day. It's got to mature. It's got to marinate. Let all those flavors come to life and blend together. So it's really not good until the second day. Now the challenge is that salsa has a seven day shelf life. So if I've got to set up my prep station and it takes 20 minutes to get all my ingredients, set everything up. And regardless of how many batches I'm making at a time, it's still going to take me 20 minutes to take it down. So that's 40 minutes every day that I'm setting up and tearing down to make salsa every single day. So let's say I was to just make salsa once every six days. That is five days times four 
40 minutes, 200 minutes, over three, almost three and a half hours of production setup and teardown time that I didn't have to waste because I made enough for six days at a time. So that shelf life piece is critical. Next is the popularity. Based on the popularity of the item, you might have to make adjustments on how much you're prepping. I also wanna look at popularity according to items that just don't move. If I've got items that don't move and I can find an alternative item to them, then maybe I'm gonna get rid of some of the prep and production that I'm doing if it's not really received well and the guest doesn't love it. Again, I'm looking at those product alternatives. Are there things like in green, my diced white onion, sliced tomato, and shredded smoked cheddar that I could buy the sliced smoked cheddar, I could buy sliced tomatoes, and I can buy diced onion. So we moved to that, took those items off the production list. And then next, making sure that your pars are appropriate for how much you're making at a time. Nothing worse than having to go back and make an item when its shelf life hasn't even come close to the end of its life. That salsa example is a great example. So you can see these red items, I removed them. The chopped cilantro and the sliced green onion, just not popular enough. These replaced items in the green, and I reevaluated my mint cucumber pico. This was an item we were making daily. It had a great shelf life, so we moved it to seven days, and now we're making a lot more of it. This had a 12% overall impact on our labor, a reduction in our labor. And I was able to repurpose people to different shifts, to different day parts, to different responsibilities throughout the kitchen, um, and still find this labor savings. So very, very important piece. All right, now let's talk about promotion and demotion. So we want to promote items, and there's a lot of ways to promote items. We can promote them on the menu. We can use boxing, bolding, different colors. We can use little symbols next to it that denote that it's the staff favorite or it's the customer's favorite, most popular item. We can also do the same thing with our service. We can train our servers. So again, we want to identify what's working and what's not. Then we want to promote the items via our menu formatting, which we just talked about. And PRD, which stands for Pattern Recognition Disruption. This is probably one of the most critical pieces to talk about when it comes to changing your menu. What the biggest and smartest concepts out there know is when they are going to make price increases or menu changes, they don't just change the pricing on the current format. They reformat the menu. And I'm gonna show you in just a minute exactly how we did that with ours in a live example uh, from Helleberger and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But the consumer has a pattern recognition piece. They know what your menu is, how it's laid out. Eight out of every 10 restaurant guests any given day have been there before. So the chances that they've recognized what falls where, how much it is, how much it's worth is really, really high. You've got to twist things up. You gotta change it up a little bit so that the guest doesn't just notice the price increase. That's a critical, critical, big deal. Biggest takeaway from this entire conversation today. All right, next sales promotion. So we can index our servers and I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit and show how to do a comparison against servers and find out who's the best and try to get everybody else up to that average line. We don't need everybody to be the best. We just need the bottom to come up to the middle and we'll talk about it in a minute. So running contests, running LTOs, which stands for limited time offer or running specials, items that you can put out at a great price with great profitability. They've got limited availability. So it helps with that supply and demand equation. It's a really, really great thing to do specials. And you can also test items for future menus to figure out if they're going to make it or if they fall by the wayside. Recommendations. Now this is an oral piece in sales training and I alluded to it just a second ago. But when servers make recommendations, it is proven in study that they make 10% more in tips than people who don't give recommendations, whether the recommendation is taken or not. So from a sales training standpoint, you should have every server know what is their favorite and what is the most popular. Those two different items give guests a choice. You don't have to qualify what you mean by favorite and most popular. Maybe your most popular item as the restaurant owner is the thing that's most profitable. Maybe your favorite item in the menu is what makes you the most gross profit dollars. Those two things are different. You can make those recommendations. The guest is going to take it. They're going to feel more taken care of and you can start promoting towards ways to be more profitable. All right, now the big one. Let's talk about point of distinction. Again, we're going to follow this same pattern of identifying what's working, what's not. If you've got an item that's popular, but it's not profitable, evaluate the concept of fair market value. If it's profitable, but not popular, you might not be priced right, or it might just be too commoditized. It might be an item that every competitor in your marketplace has the same thing. Maybe they're cheaper on it. Maybe their quality is better. You've got to disrupt this concept of fair market value. Offering the same product has a consumer cost expectation. 
If I asked you how much would you expect to pay for a burger if you go out to a fine dining restaurant, you're going to be able to put a price on it. Everybody in the world is able to put a price on what that value is. But if I were to change the item and do something different that somebody hasn't had before, like a buffalo burger that's made out of American bison or a Kobe burger or Wagyu, A5, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you offer an item, build a recipe unlike what anybody else offers, the consumer doesn't know what the fair market value of that is. That allows you to capture more profitability. Offering unique products, presentation, interpretation, combinations, etc. Do not have a fair market value and afford us more room to set our own price and profit more. Here's some examples of some items that we've made that have done really well. These gold layered chicken wings. How much are gold wings worth? Nobody knows, but they're literally eating gold, so it must be worth a ton of money. We recently did this giant eight ounce meatball over a pasta, and it was so Instagrammable, it was very sexy. Nobody knew how much that cost. I know how much spaghetti and meatball should cost, but what does it take to make an eight ounce meatball? I have no idea. Either it is a consumer, it's a big deal. Our gourmet shakes are really, really awesome on the dessert side. That looks like it's worth $15, $20 to me. I have no idea, it's crazy. Took something as simple as street corn, uh, our elote, and added a little bit of crushed up flaming hot Cheeto. Never seen it before, no idea how much those ingredients cost to put it on there, but I can't get it anywhere else, so I'm willing to pay for it. Our cinnamon roll French toast, excellent product. Nobody's seen anything like this. It worked really well. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about that point of distinction. Figure out a way to set yourself apart. And the bonus is, when you set yourself apart, all of this stuff becomes Instagrammable. And that's people promoting your business for you. Well done. So let's talk a little bit of menu management strategy. I said this was the biggest takeaway, so we have to disrupt that pattern recognition. So analyze the menu and each category. Find out specifically what's working and what's not. Do not leave the menu the same and just change the prices. Use the scalpel versus the hatchet approach. You can't also just mark everything up two bucks. You've got to use some of these previous strategies where there's some product and portion changes, reduction, increases, reallocating items, adding different categories, new items to categories. All of this stuff is critical. And if you're already reformatting it, you might as well reformat it in general. Doesn't mean you have to do a complete redesign on the background, the artwork, just moving some of your boxes, your fonts, your texts, your items, even the location of the categories will suffice. Next, eliminate column pricing. When you put pricing in a column, you steer the guest's eyes to look at the price first. The reason why we tuck pricing is because we want them to read our menu like a book. You read the category first. If the category is of interest, you look at items. You see an item name, that sounds interesting, you read the description. If the description sounds great, then you're buying emotionally and you're justifying logically. That's how people spend money. We want to send them through that journey that way. Not send them over to the price first so that they make a decision based on price before even reading the description. They'll disqualify it immediately. It's a really, really bad strategy. Think about that when you're working on your menu and your pricing. And then make the consumer rationalize price rounding correction. So there's a rule of 10%. So that basic rule is if you've got items on your menu that are $10.29, $10.29 means nothing to the guest. In fact, with $10.29, you could easily move it to $10.99 and the guest doesn't even notice. Because there was a study done that says items that are $5 and less, you take your price increases at 25 cents at a time. It's about a 5% increase. Items between five and $10, you take your price increase at 50 cents. So you go from 50 to 99 and you stay between that range. And then at $10 and above, you can go all the way up to 99. No matter what your cents are on the menu currently, you can go all the way up to 99 if it's a double digit item, $10 or more, and the guest doesn't even notice because that is never more than a 10% increase across any of those three pricing thresholds. So something to think about. All right, now we're gonna talk about some PMIX analytics. So if you have a POS system, which I hope you do, if you don't, get one. It's, this is critical. You've gotta be able to analyze your data. And one of the most prolific exercises we use monthly is our PMIX analysis. So we have to be able to identify the impact. How profitable is each item? Not just on its food cost percentage, but on its dollars in contribution. I'm gonna give you an example. If I had a salad that was $10 and it was a 20% cost, I'm making eight bucks. If I had a steak that is 
$50 and it has a 40% food cost. That seems terrible, but I'm making $30 every time I sell it. I would rather put $30 in the bank than eight. I don't care if the food cost is higher. I care about the contribution to gross profit dollar. So in this example from Helleberger, we look at our PMIX report. You can see my categories. You can see the quantity of items sold, what the current price is, what the sales total is, what my food cost percentage is, what the food cost is in dollars, what my gross profit is in dollars, and what my expense in those cost of goods were. Now, what I'm looking for are the items that exceed my threshold. I still want to manage within a concept of food cost. So for me, I don't want anything to be over 33%. So I've highlighted every single item that's above 33%, and those are the items that we're gonna rework. We're either gonna work the price, the portion, the presentation, the product, whatever it happens to be. So now I'm gonna focus on our menu and show you how we made the changes based on the analysis of our P-Mix. This is Helleburger. This was our original iteration of our menu. You could see this Cuban sandwich that we shifted to the Barbecuban. Here is the new menu. So completely different format. We made some pretty big changes. So I wanna talk about the changes. We reformatted. We did price increases, which you can look at straight across the board. We took new items and categories and added new items and categories both. We did some item reduction, we got rid of some product. So the first thing that we did was we demoted our build your own. This whole backyard burger was a big build your own, but it wasn't really good for us because we would have customers that would make weird builds and they would complain about the burger, blaming us for something that they built poorly. So we decided, you know what? We know we could build it better than them. We're just gonna stick with the items that we build better than anybody else. And if somebody wants to call out something, make their own, we can still accommodate that, but we're just not gonna advertise it. So that reduction helped. Then we attacked the portion. We didn't wanna change our eight ounce patty on our regular burgers, but on our buffalo burger and on our lamb burger, we changed those from eight ounces down to seven ounces. That one ounce increase or decrease and the price increase helped us make these items wildly popular and more profitable. The Barbecuban was the example we talked about and that item was now a little bit of a price increase and a huge increase in the profitability. Next, our point of distinction and promotion. So you can see over here, our yard dogs, we used to average five, six bucks a dog. We shifted these to our devil dogs. We changed our names to the seven sins. We completely rebuilt these items. We wanted them more in line with the cost of our burgers so that we weren't affecting our average ticket by dropping it so people could order lower priced items. Next, we did a production piece on our boomer, our homemade mushroom burger. We were grinding up mushrooms after we'd sauteed them. We were binding them. We were patting them and forming them and we were making them like every three days because they would purge. And then we'd question, why are we holding them fresh? We decided to freeze them, thaw them, cook them and test it and it worked. It was a magnificent product, came out very, very similar. The difference was unnoticeable. We were able to extend our production on that and not have to be so labor rich in making that every three days. Next, we did our point of distinction. So we had this one salad, the chopper salad. It was pretty popular, but it was just one. So we decided to add a whole new category, the devil's lettuce, and we added two items based on this. One more traditional salad, one more of kind of a protein-based salad, which there's been a lot of demand for, and that item worked out really well for us. On product, we used to cut our own French fries. We were able to source somebody who did fresh cut French fries through our distributor, we got that product instead, saved us so much time and headache and frustration and space. It was a big, big deal. And the rest of the items we kept the same. So now here's the before and the after. On the left-hand side, it's slightly gray. You can't really tell. Here's our new menu analysis. You can see all those items that once were above 33. Now we took this amount of a price increase on every single item. And you can see how we brought everything down below that 33%. In some cases, far exceeding the reduction that we needed, but it made the whole menu profitable. 4% savings in our total expense of goods. So now let's talk sales training. So selling your way to success, raise the guest check average. So quick five minute hack, pull a server or a cashier check average report. Every server, you should be able to pull this on your POS. You should be able to look at the sales by server. You should be able to look at their check average. You should be able to look at their category mix. So what we look at is dads. These are our items that we upsell. Those are desserts, appetizers, drinks, and specials. We wanna measure how much as a percentage of what each server sells do they do and then compare 
compare them. Who's the worst? Who's the best? What's the middle look? And we want to look at the tip average. It, what we can usually show is that the tip average on a higher guest check average is better. Obviously, the tip dollar amount is going to be better. That's an easy thing to promote. We want our people to sell these dads and we want them to make recommendations because they're going to make more money. But what we also see with those servers who have a higher check average, they also have a higher tip percentage. That's proof enough. So let's take a look about that sales training, the five minute hack. I wanna look at who is the best index. I got Awesome Allison, I've got my store average at 15 bucks, and I've got Eddie Excuses who's down at the bottom at 10%. I wanna close this delta. All I wanna do is bring my bottom people up to just average. I wanna make them average. That's a huge money maker for them and for us. So here's an example of this report. You can see all my different servers. You can see their average guest check. You can see where the average line is. And this is where I'm trying to bring all these people up here, down here, up to just the average. Get them up 2188, show them the impact that it's gonna create for them. Here's the guest delta we can close. Here's the extra additional revenue that we can make. And you can see, if I could just bring everybody up to average, it's almost a 15% increase in sales. This is crazy. This will offset this problem with our labor expense and our cost of goods. This is amazing. I encourage you to run this. You gotta run this. That's it. It was a long session, but I hope you got some value in it. Some really, really critical takeaways. I'm just going to repeat. Don't just change the menu. Prices, you've got to reformat a little bit. Make sure that you're promoting. Get your servers out there talking about it or your cashiers making those recommendations. My favorite is, our most popular is. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor the whole thing and go through it all again. I'm Bo Bryant, the Restaurant Giant. I appreciate you tuning in. If you got value in this, please subscribe, please like, and most importantly, please share. We're in this together and we got to get out of it together. Talk to you soon.